Good afternoon, Olive, Arlo, and Frank. <clears throat> Grandpa coming to you from the living room in Jack's speech. I was up at Juggernaut Park with your grandmother today. She hung out on the beach there, and I went out and did a little stand-up paddleboarding, although there wasn't much standing up. <laughs> um, there was a lot more kneeling, kneel boarding, I guess they could call it. So a lot of times when I talk to you about <clears throat> my faith, <clears throat> I'll have a caveat, and, I, and I'll say, look, I'm not trying to convince you that my position is the correct position, that you should be a believer in Jesus, although I, I sincerely hope and I fervently pray on a regular basis that, that all three of you would be. Sorry, my voice is failing, but I need to get these things done because you never know how much time you have. I hope I have many years. Olive, I hope I get to buy you your first drink. So if you're 21 at that time, I'll be 91. If you're 18 at that time, I'll be 88. <laughs> I'll probably be just having some spiked pudding or something at the old age home. You'll be there visiting. So, but today, This is a Christian message. I want to talk to you today about witnessing. Now, what is witnessing? It means telling others about your journey to, to find Christ. Although, as a good friend of mine said when I first got saved, uh, you didn't find him. He wasn't lost. <laughs> <laughs> you were the one that was lost. You, um, um, that, that, that when you find Jesus, and then as you walk the Christian walk, and you tell other people about that, and the reason that you witness is to convince people that what you believe is true and that they should believe. So I'm being clear about that. By the time you're watching these videos, some of these adult videos, you will be adults, and, and you'll be able to make up your own mind what you believe. So, I got saved in, I think, early 1996, like the middle of January, <clears throat> pretty sure. And I had been what I called an evangelical agnostic. Agnostics believe that you can't know if there's a God. It's beyond human understanding. And so that's what I believed. And, and Frank and Tom and, and your Uncle Sam, they, they were kids and, and, and Alex, Becca and Jim, they were kids that I told that, well, you can't really know if there's a God, so it's probably a fairy tale. And then I got saved, so I had to deal with that. Like, okay, I've been telling them that this is probably false, and now I believe it. So, and I dealt with it over the years. This is not a video about that, although I might do a video about that someday. Now, what happens is when you get saved, you feel so different. I mean, I went from figuring that I would never know if there was a God <clears throat> to having him speak to me and then having to decide, well, Either he spoke to me or I'm hearing voices. Because he spoke to me plainly. It wasn't like, Frank, you know, like over the PA system. Nobody else heard him speak to me, but he spoke to me. 
And he, and he actually spoke to me twice. He spoke to me when I was around 17 years old, and then he spoke to me in 1996. So in 1996, I would have been a, uh, 43, 42, going on 43, I think. And um, the first thing that happens, because you just your heart is just filled with so much joy, is you start going to people and going like, you need to believe in Jesus, and you try to talk them into it, and it doesn't work. You want to make somebody mad? Go up to them and try to convince them that they need Jesus. Especially, like, I hadn't led the best life, and people go, wait a minute, I don't think you're a very good human being, Frank, and now you're telling me how to live. But, see, you're not telling them how to live. You're telling them what you found. But it, you really don't know. I mean, you're not grounded yet in the faith. <clears throat> and some people, <laughs> some people even get weird about it. I knew this guy, really nice guy, in Lower Township at this one Bible study that I used to go to and lead worship at. And he was, like I said something to the, to the worship guy, the uh, Bible study leader, who eventually opened up his own church down there. And I said, yeah, what's up with, with that guy? And he said, oh, he's odd for God. <laughs> um, and he was. He'd come diddy bopping in and we'd be in the middle of a Bible study and he'd completely interrupt it and go like, God laid it on my heart to come in here and tell you guys. And then he would tell us something and he would turn around and go right out the door. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> like, God didn't want you to stay and learn about the Bible. But like I say, he was, he was a very, very nice man. But he was odd for God. And, and he, he got into a... a an automobile accident. He was in a parking lot of some hardware store, and and he backed into another car. The driver was there, and and so the driver came up, was like, "Why are you going?" <laughs> and this guy went, um, "Oh, I'm so sorry, but you know, you need Jesus in your life," and he started to preach the gospel to him and the guy just kept getting madder and madder and he kept going see you're getting more and more mad you need Jesus <laughs> that that doesn't work there, but there's a better way there's a better way than like harassing people and arguing with them and I know some really really grounded Christians that argue. That, that's like their ministry is arguing with people. I, I have one person that I'm thinking of. Uh, he's like the Ben Shapiro of evangelical Christians. He just like, oh, no, that's wrong. Boom. There's a much better way. So if you meet somebody and you start to talk to them about things and you say well I'm a born again Christian and they say yeah you know I never believed any of that stuff that crap if you start to try to convince that person that you're correct and they're incorrect it's hardly ever going to work but there's one thing that you can do you can pray for that person now, it might be somebody that you never see again, somebody who you run into. You know, you're sitting at a bar at an airport, strike up a conversation with somebody next to you, waiting for your flights, and, and you say, yeah, well, you know, I'm a born-again Christian. And they go, uh, well, you know their name. You just write down their name where they're from, whatever, because God knows who that is. And then keep a, a prayer journal and, and pray.
for that person. You don't even have to tell them, like, yeah, I'll be, I'll be praying for you. Because it's not like voodoo where you say, I'll be sticking pins in a doll. And then the person goes, oh, my shoulder hurts. I grab my arm, I didn't grab my shoulder. <laughs> the guy did the voodoo doll, the pin too low. I just hit my arm instead of the shoulder. So you pray for somebody, and and you pray for all kinds of things. I pray over the people in, in Kensington. There's two pages on Facebook, Lost in Kensington and Found in Kensington, but they're both about people who are searching for loved ones who are there, or, you know, they're, they're trying to get help for loved ones who are there. So when I see these, I, I pray f for those people. And then I also pray for you guys, especially you, Frank, at the same time. So I'm praying for others, and then I'm praying for, for my family. And, and there's, you know, I'll put in the remarks section, like the prayer, the praying hands emoji. And, and sometimes people will thank me, like, oh, thanks for, for praying. But it, it, I don't care. I'm not doing it for thanks. I'm doing it so that these people would get saved. That's always my first prayer, because you never know. You know, somebody like Billy Graham, who was this evangelical guy that went around the world doing these giant stadium, like, um, what do they call them? Crusades. Although there was a bird outside today and, and we're nursing it back to health. So your dad just texted me. It's probably something to do with the bird. But um, so he, he would do these big crusades and thousands of people would get saved at each one of them. And, and so he was probably going to be in heaven when we get there, but you never know about people. So my first prayer is that somebody would get saved. Like your position on whatever, the death penalty, abortion, a lot of things that, that Christians and non-Christians argue over, they mean nothing compared to salvation. Salvation means you're going to be with the Lord for eternity. And the opposite of that is when you die, you'll be eternally separated from the love of God. Whether that's this cold outer darkness or fiery hell and brimstone, hail and brimstone, fiery hell. I don't know exactly. I just don't want to be part of it. I want to be in the worshiping the Lord forever bracket. And I want that for every human being I ever meet. Now, I don't pray for every human being I ever meet, but when I feel the Lord wants me to pray for them, I pray for them. So you can do that. Now here's something else you can do. In, in 2005, I was in Israel. And I'm going to tell you two stories. But the first one was I was in Israel with this church. It was a Calvary Chapel from North Jersey. And I didn't really know the people. I knew, what, I knew the pastor of a church that I was leading worship at in, in Cape May Courthouse who was going. And then he decided not to go. But I had friends, Sonny and Linda. They were going. And we spent nine or 11 days over in Israel. Wonderful time. So we started in the Galilee, and then we worked our way down, and we went out like to the Dead Sea and all. And then, then we finished up in, uh, in Jerusalem. And... I was sitting on this wall waiting for 
Sonny and Linda to come down where we're going to go out to dinner or something. And I'm watching these people walk down the street and I said, Lord, send somebody me, to me to ask them about you. Simple prayer. I didn't bow my head. I didn't pray out loud. I didn't try to look like, you know, oh, this is a really spiritual guy. So somebody come up and go, oh, you look really spiritual. And I prayed that prayer. I sat there for like five minutes and nothing happened. So I went into the concierge and I asked the concierge if he would ring Sonny and Linda's room. And he, he said, you're a born again Christian, aren't you? And I said, yeah, yes I am. He said, would you mind if I ask you a question? Could, could you take a couple minutes? And I went, <laughs> thank you, Jesus. Yeah, what's your question? And he said, I, ju I want, he said, I see born again Christians and they're different. They seem happier. It's like they don't have any troubles. And, and I want to know what that is, what that is. So I said, well, it, it's not that they're happier, but they're joyful. It's, it's not a matter of happiness. Joy and happiness are two different things. You can be joyful in the midst of some sorrowful parts of your life. I mean, there's all kinds of Christians who were fed the lions and burned at the stake and stuff like that, who took joy to their death. They weren't happy that that happened to them. But they were joyful. And it's, it's because we know, we, we can read the end of the book. We know why the world is so horrible. And we know that we're not going to be part of that. We're going to be part of something completely different. And, and the fellow said, uh, you know, I, yeah, I don't know if I agree with you or not. So I said, here's my, and back then it wasn't this thing where you were text messaging people all over the world. Although, I mean, I had a cell phone and you could text message people. But it was expensive. So I said, here's my email address. Just send me an email right now with your name. The blank email. And when I get home, I'll send you, send you some information. So for several months after that, I had a back and forth. I have no idea whatever happened with this fellow. He's a nice young guy. I think he was Arab. I think he was an Arab. Because we were there on a Shabbat and, and the, none of the Jews could work. So we were in the Arab quarter. And the whole staff that day was Arab. So I asked and I received. Then in 2007, in February of 2007, I was, um, or, or, yeah, no. In January of 2007, I was in Thomas Jefferson Hospital in Philadelphia in the midst of some cancer-related mishigash <laughs> craziness. And I was in a den of pain and suffering. I would have a roommate, and I'd get up in the morning, and I didn't have a roommate because the roommate died and was taken out in the middle of the night, and I just didn't wake up. 
There was a lady across the hall, and her family was there all the time, her daughter, her husband. And her son-in-law would come, spend hours and hours there. And they took this lady to put her in a bedpan. And her bones were so brittle. This, this was a cancer ward. Everybody in there, essentially, was almost everybody was dying from cancer. And they went to move her, and one of her arms broke. I don't think that they really like, dropped her or anything like that. Just maybe bumped her into the bed or something, and, and her arm broke. And she was screaming. And, and I would sit there reading the Bible, and I thought, Lord, this, this is a place where people really need you because they're close to finding out whether what they believe is true or not. Send somebody, please, to ask about you. And the son-in-law, next thing you know, came in the room, and I'm sitting there reading the Bible in like an easy chair next to my bed. And he said, how do you do it? <laughs> said, I, I don't know, what do you mean? How do I do what? He said, I come past here, and there's all these people that are, that are dying, and you've got this peace. Now, I didn't think that I was exuding some sort of peaceful vibe or anything like that. I was just sitting there reading the Bible. And he said, you know, if you just have peace, how can you be peaceful when this is going on in your life? And I said, well, it's simple. I have Jesus. And he goes, well, yeah, I've, I've heard people can, you know, get saved and all that kind of stuff, but Jesus doesn't want me. I said, well, what do you, why do you say that? And he said, you don't know what I've done in my life. It'd be too hard to clean up what I've done. And I said, oh, no. The worst people in the world, Stalin, Hitler, Mao Zedong, people that killed millions of people, they could get saved and, and be with God for eternity. And he went, how? So at this point in time, he was on his knees, so he was kind of looking straight at me. And I said, well, you're already on your knees. Why don't we pray? And this is what I want you to pray. And I told him what, what he would be asking God. So I started the prayer off, and then I, I said, okay, now you take over and ask him to forgive you. And save your soul, and he did that, and he got saved, and he jumped up and said, thank you so much, and look, it had nothing to do with me, it has to do with him, but you need to now do certain things, you need to find a good Bible-believing church, you need to go there and get grounded, he said, well, the first thing I need to do is I need to go tell everybody across the hallway what just happened. And, and I thought, <laughs> that is not going to go over well. But hey, maybe he went over there and maybe the lady who was dying of cancer got saved before she passed. So that was two times that that, that prayer was immediately answered. Now, it's been 17 years since then, and, and I don't remember anything like that big time. But um, I did notice this, and, and part of it's probably that I was a lot less grounded than I am now. And you're always a work in progress. 
nobody ever has this figured out. The, the more you, uh, I think it's the, the Dunning-Kruger effect, um, the more you understand what sin is, the worse you believe your sins are. So I probably sin a lot less than I did like when I first got saved. But my sins look a lot worse now because I understand it more. So I think I'm a horrible sinner. But if you graphed it, you'd go like, nah, your sin's going down. But it's not as simple as that. So, uh, but I noticed that um, if I let people know who I'm friends with, that I'm born again, and usually the way I say it is sitting at a bar with somebody, got a beer, and I go, well, I don't act like it, and you're going to be very surprised by this, but I'm a born-again Christian. I love Jesus. And if they say, like, oh, well, I guess you're going to preach to me, I go, no. I only tell people what I believe if they ask me. And when they ask me, if they ask me, like, why do you smile all the time? You know, why, why do you have that peace in you? Normally what I'll say is, you don't want to know. And they'll go, no, no. I, I really want to know. And I'll go, you don't want to know. But since, you, you know, you said twice that you do want to know, then... I have Jesus in my heart. <laughs> and a lot of times they'll go, oh, there we go. Uh, you're going to be, you know, I'm getting other bird. I, <laughs> my grandmother said about the bird outside, oh, if we only knew somebody who was like a bird veterinarian. <laughs> I said, no, two doors away is a guy who is a bird surgeon. He does birds, and she said, no, he only does reptiles. I said, no, he, he's a surgeon on, on birds and reptiles. I guess cold-blooded animals. He doesn't do puppies because <laughs> they're hot-blooded, warm-blooded animals, whatever they call it. So if you tell somebody that you're born again and then you, you just leave it alone and you don't pester them, like, oh, you got to believe, you got to believe, you got to believe. Because you have to trust God that God's put you into this situation. And so when you mention in a conversation that, that you're born again, now that person knows something about you. And it's a really strong way to witness because every once in a while, that person will come back to you and go, I have a question for you. And I want your perspective as a Christian. And I get to, to witness. Now, for me, we're never promised tomorrow. Like, I want to go over the top and go, this is why you should believe now. Get on your knees now. It's in God's hands. It's in God's time. That's why prayer is the most important part of witnessing because God controls it all. We don't really control any of it. So when when they don't believe, they'll do that. They'll seek your counsel from time to time. And I, I have a friend that I worked with up in New Jersey at the IRS who within the last couple of years killed himself. And I hope I'll see him again someday. He was a nice young man. He was tortured. You could tell that he had all kinds of issues in his life. And he would come to me and, and seek my counsel just because he knew that I'm a believer. And But he, he felt...
he felt at ease coming to me because I wasn't going to pester him. I wasn't going to tell him. I was going to listen to him, make a couple probably pithy points, brief to the, to the point, pithy. And, and then also, if, if the other person is a believer, then they'll go, oh, wow, yeah. Yeah, I'm a believer. And so now you, you have an, a new friend. But at the end of witnessing, when it's time to do it, when God lays it on your heart and says, okay, I want you to close the deal with this person. And I ask you to do this now in your own heart. Because I'm assuming that you're old enough to make your own decision by the time you're watching something about your grandpa talking about witnessing. Is four things. You need Jesus as your Savior. You need to turn from your sin. You need Jesus to forgive your sins. And then you need to follow him. You need him as your Savior. You need to turn from your sins. You need to ask him to forgive your sins. And then you need to follow him. Sorry, I looked down at my notes. <laughs> I should have that memorized. And I do. If I'm, if I'm talking to somebody and they, and they say, well, what do I need to do? You'll know. So I'm inviting you to do that right now. To say, Jesus... I'm a sinner, and I, I've had enough of that. I need you in my life. I, need, I ask that you forgive my sins and then I want to follow you. I want you to provide a place for me to worship and, and learn and grow as a Christian, as a believer. In Jesus' name, amen. Peace out.